Russia's radical intelligentsia talked about the need for revolution for decades. So many polemical articles were written. So many revolutionary messages were delivered to workers and peasants by the earnest young men and women who sought to transform Russia. But the Tsar state closed ranks during the second half of the 19th century. That made the act of espousing radical ideology more dangerous. Young activists who'd ventured to the countryside to work and agitate among the people now felt the vengeance of the autocracy. Sergei Kravchinsky, a terrorist turned revolutionary propagandist, says the Russian state doled out sentences of years of hard labor for two to three speeches made in private to a handful of working men or for a single book read or lent. Thus, he said, what is freely done in every country in Europe, the Russian state punished like murder. Some radicals ended their revolutionary endeavors on the scaffold, like Vladimir Lenin's older brother, Alexander Ulyanov, who was hanged in 1887. Others found themselves in living graves, entombed in terrifying prison fortresses like Schlieselberg, east of St. Petersburg. Between 1861 and 1874, the Tsar Alexander II had undertaken a limited program of liberalization in Russia's administrative, educational, judicial, and social apparatus known as the Great Reforms. But this era of enlightened despotism ended with Alexander's assassination in 1881. The radicals who murdered him thought he'd done too little, too slowly. Now, the Enlightenment would fade, and only the despot would remain in the form of Alexander's successors, who ruled oppressively and absolutely. Many young Russians who flirted with radical activism surely chafed when they encountered the heavy hand of the Tsar's political police. How many young idealists, whose names have since been lost to history, found themselves consigned to long terms of hard labor in the most inhospitable circumstances. Some certainly abandoned the dreams of youth for a quieter life, indulging in nothing more radical than reading a little Blinsky, Pisarev, or Chernyshevsky in their free time. Vasaryan Bielinsky was a Russian literary critic who lived between 1811 and 1848. He espoused the Hegelian view that a nation's art and history are closely related. That intellectual framework would be influential on a subsequent generation of radical intelligentsia. Dmitry Pisarev was an intellectual writer who lived from 1840 to 1868 and celebrated Ivan Turgenev's 1862 portrait of Nihilist in his novel, Fathers and Sons. Like Turgenev in that novel, Pisarev argued that art is useless. He said that a thinking man's only worthwhile endeavor is to solve forever the unavoidable question of hungry and naked people. Pisarov himself published a critique of the Tsarist regime that led to his imprisonment that same year and turned him into something of a celebrity before his early death at age 27. Nikolai Chernyshevsky, who lived from 1828 to 1889 and would be exiled to Siberia late in life, was a radical journalist who promoted class struggle. He sought the revolutionary overthrow of the autocracy and the creation of a socialist society. Chernyshevsky would be influential in future thinkers as diverse as Vladimir Lenin and Ayn Rand. Still, when the revolution finally came, it was due not to the agitating of these radical thinkers, nor to the words of propaganda penned by the young Vladimir Lenin. Lenin had long since fled to find asylum in Western Europe. Instead, revolution would come on the heels of World War I, the devastating global conflict that pitted Russia against Germany on the brutal Eastern Front, and which left ordinary Russians hungry, cold, and demoralized, with no faith that their government could manage the crisis. The last Romanov Tsar, Nicholas II, who ruled from 1894 until early 1917, tried to stave off popular unrest and revolutionary radicalism, largely through fear and repression. But the breaking point came when his government proved incapable of steering Russia safely through the First World War. 
the greatest crisis Russia had seen since the Napoleonic invasion of 1812. Almost precisely a century after Napoleon's failed assault on Moscow, Alexander Guchkov, the leader of the moderate Octoberist party, warned in 1913 of a greater impending catastrophe. At his party's conference, Guchkov asked, whither is the government policy, or rather lack of policy carrying us? The answer, he said, was towards an inevitable and grave catastrophe. Guchkov told his assembled colleagues when the catastrophe would take effect remained uncertain, but he felt that Russia was on the verge of being plunged into a period of protracted chronic anarchy, which would lead to the dissolution of the empire. In February 1914, the Tsar's security chief, Pyotr Donovan, warned the Tsar himself that Russia was unprepared for the Great War and likely faced defeat. Donovan would die the next year before his predictions became history and fact. Still, he laid out the forecast in great detail. He wrote, the trouble will start with the blaming of the government for all disasters, followed by revolutionary agitations throughout the country, with socialist slogans capable of arousing and rallying the masses, beginning with the division of the land and succeeded by a division of all valuables and property. The defeated army, having lost its most dependable men and carried away by the tide of primitive peasant desire for land, will find itself too demoralized to serve as a bulwark of law and order. The legislative institutions and the intellectual opposition parties, lacking real authority in the eyes of the people, will be powerless to stop the popular tide, and Russia will be flung into hopeless anarchy. And indeed, it was. Russia had tried its hand at revolution once already. In October 1905, after a turbulent year of strikes and protests and the unsuccessful Russo-Japanese War of 1904 and 1905, Nicholas II raised the collective hopes of his people with a proclamation known as the October Manifesto. Issued to halt a 10-day general strike that crippled the country, the manifesto established a state Duma, a legislative body whose members would be popularly elected, and indicated that Russia would finally enjoy freedom of speech, press, and assembly. In addition, Nicholas announced the amnesty of political prisoners to quell the raging turmoil that threatened to engulf the empire. And yet, over the next several years, those freed were replaced by thousands more. The Tsar also declared that workers now had the right to form unions and strike. But in the ensuing decade, the state inevitably responded viciously and repressively to interrupt work stoppages. The state Duma was indeed elected and formed, but it was only a quasi-parliamentary body with no control over foreign affairs or military concerns. Furthermore, much of the budget fell outside the Duma's control, and the Duma couldn't initiate or finalize legislation without the Tsar's approval. Emperor Nicholas II retained supreme power, and the same social, economic, and political tensions that had prompted what became known as the 1905 Revolution still existed a decade later. So what we had was merely sham constitutionalism. In the summer of 1914, as a new diplomatic crisis percolated through Europe, social un unrest threatened Russia's domestic stability as well. Yet, when Nicholas II announced that his country was at war with Austria and Germany in August 1914, 200,000 of his subjects cheered him from Palace Square in St. Petersburg. They erupted into a spontaneous chorus of the national anthem, God Save the Tsar overcome with feelings of patriotism. Educated elites were the most enthusiastic. They threw their support behind the state, and as throughout much of Europe, believed that the boys would be home by Christmas. In contrast, many of the young Russian soldiers called up to serve were less enthused. Massive state conscription campaigns in 1914 and again in 1916 in Central Asia were met by riots. To effectively thwart 
any protest as Russia galvanized for war, the government established martial law in the capital of St. Petersburg, which in 1914, it renamed the more Slavic sounding Petrograd in a burst of patriotic sentiment. Martial law was also decreed in Moscow and Western border regions as well. And censors clamped down on press accounts of the war to mitigate the chance that populations at home would be demoralized if Russia fared poorly at the front. With a population nearing 170 million people, the country had the human capital required for an extended conflict, yet it lacked other critical resources. Russia's gross domestic product was less than half that of its German enemy. The Russian economy relied on foreign loans. It had few usable ports, and its overstretched rail system was inadequate to transport troops and supplies to the front. For these and other reasons, Russia deserved the oft-used description that she was mighty but poor. Nicholas II had made a lot of bad decisions during his almost 23-year reign, but among the most, among the worst, was his decision to ban the manufacture and sale of alcohol beginning in July 1914. This was years before the United States adopted his, its own prohibition in 1920. The Tsar's decree took effect during mobilization as Russia entered the war. Now, having a sober military and workforce as the country embarked on a massive military campaign might have seemed like a good idea. But you have to remember that the Russian state obtained up to a third of its revenue from the government monopoly on the distillation and sale of alcohol. So just when the government needed funds more than ever, the czar needlessly slashed an important source of its income. Russia mobilized almost 15 million men and had a casualty rate greater than 60%, suffering more losses during the First World War than any other country. And the devastation came quickly. Only weeks after hostilities began, 140,000 men were lost to the Germans at the disastrous Battle of Tannenberg in present-day Poland. And this was just the beginning. By spring 1915, Russia had no choice but to retreat before a combined German-Austrian onslaught. That year alone, some 2.5 million Russian soldiers were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. Many had found themselves on the front lines without such essentials as guns or bullets. Now, falling back, a scorched earth policy and retreat rendered life untenable for many civilians. Three to four million civilians were displaced. Refugees flooded into cities. Massive inflation threatened economic collapse. The home front became almost as problematic as the battlefront. So the Duma urged Nicholas II to reorganize his government and appoint a new council of ministers. In stating this point, let me make a brief aside. This legislative body, the Duma, as presently constituted, was not a radical body. It was pretty conservative. Because of electoral changes some years earlier in 1907, property qualifications for voting and indirect elections had disenfranchised most members of the working class and non-Russian populations. Nevertheless, and to the horror of nearly everyone in government, Nicholas rejected the Duma's call for reorganization. Perhaps just as disastrously, the Tsar decided to assume personal command of the army with staggering consequences. Nicholas II now owned this war. Mismanagement, strategic failures, and defeats all fell directly at his feet. Meanwhile, Nicholas was being counseled at home and in the offices of government by his mystical advisor, Grigory Rasputin, the self-proclaimed holy man from Siberia. Rasputin was treating the Tsar's hemophilic son, Alexei, and using his influence over the Romano family to advance his own power and material gains. And he did so while engaging in drunken debauchery with aristocrats and prostitutes alike, scandalizing many in the capital. Nicholas, 
maintained his belief that Rasputin was a good, religious, simple-minded Russian, in spite of the warnings of prominent government officials and ample evidence to the contrary. Instead of removing Rasputin, Nicholas fired and demoted government ministers at will, especially those who had raised the alarm. In less than two years, Russia had four different prime ministers and five different ministers of the interior. The French ambassador famously said that at the present moment, the Russian empire is run by lunatics. With Nicholas at the front, after September 1915, Rasputin seemed to exercise ever more influence over his wife, Alexandra, and the government. Alexandra, it's important to remember, was German, not Russian by birth, although she was also the granddaughter of Britain's Queen Victoria. Europe's royal families were closely connected by blood. Unfortunately, Alexandra's German roots accentuated lurid rumors that she was indulging in a sexual relationship with Rasputin and conspiring to hand victory to her German brethren. By most accounts, there was no truth to the innuendos of sex and treason. But the rumors eroded the mystique of the autocracy and people's faith. In December 1916, conspirators seeking to restore the Romanov's reputation murdered Rasputin and dumped his body into a canal. By this time, the country was exhausted from three years of war, ethnic tension, food and fuel shortages, and a loss of faith in the government. With Nicholas now the commander-in-chief and the latest offensive ending indecisively, the concept of the emperor's divine infallibility evaporated. A month before Rasputin's murder, Pavel Milikov, a liberal member of the State Duma, had lamented the series of missteps by the Tsar's government. Before the assembled Duma representatives, Milikov publicly voiced the question that so many secretly wondered. He questioned whether Nicholas II's actions resulted from stupidity or treason. The Russian Empire was in a precarious position. In the military, tensions ran high between a privileged elitist officer corps on the one hand, and on the other, peasant recruits who were abused by their superiors and forced to sacrifice their lives for a government that seemed to value them so little. At home, the population faced startling shortages in basic necessities. Food and fuel were increasingly hard to come by. Bread lines formed before daybreak as women endured sub-zero temperatures in the hopes of procuring food for their families. Too often, the needed bread never materialized or it was priced out of reach. On February 23, 1917, a common spark ignited the human tensions into revolution. Women in the capital organized demonstrations to protest food shortages and working conditions as part of the commemoration of International Women's Day. This socialist holiday, celebrated in Russia since 1913, afforded a cross-section of Petrograd women the occasion to express their collective discontent. By the end of the day, more than 100,000 striking workers and demonstrators were in the streets. Authorities surmised the agitation would evaporate by day's end. To their surprise, it escalated instead. The next day, 200,000 people turned out. George Mason University historian Rex Wade contends that the women's call for bread and better conditions activated the already restive industrial workers, garnered support from broader circles of lower and even middle-class elements of the population, and elicited sympathy from the soldiers. On Sunday, February 26, 1917, the Tsarist government ordered soldiers to fire on the growing crowds. Some followed directions, killing hundreds of people but a general and increasing reluctance of soldiers to use force against the people didn't go unnoticed. The next day, February 27th, was decisive. The State Duma now declared itself to be the provisional government, having disobeyed the Tsar's orders to disband the previous day. And soldiers 
openly refused to move against the demonstrators. Members of the Volinsky Guard Regiment shot their commanding officer, who'd given the order to fire on the protesters the day before. Some officers and military commanders even hid from their troops as large numbers of soldiers mutinied and went over to the protesters' side. Meanwhile, professional revolutionaries called upon workers to organize workers' councils, or Soviets, outside of the largely privileged Duma. Industrial workers answered the call. Within a week, more than 1,200 deputies were elected to the newly formed Petrograd Soviet of Workers' and Soldiers' Deputies. Nichols II never expected the situation to deteriorate so rapidly. He left military headquarters for Petrograd in an attempt to reclaim control. Along the way, his imperial railcar was stopped, and he was confronted by his complete loss of authority. After consulting with military leaders and being forced to acknowledge that he had no other choice, Nicholas abdicated. Still, worried about the health and safety of his son, Alexei, Nicholas also knew that he couldn't turn over power to his heir and the next in line to the throne. So, on March 2nd, 1917, he instead transferred the title of Tsar to his brother, Mikhail Romanov. However, Mikhail recognized that enraged masses would not condone this transfer of power. So on March 3rd, he too abdicated the throne. And the more than 300-year-old Romanov dynasty came to an abrupt end. Few mourned. A dozen years earlier, the massacre known as Bloody Sunday had shattered popular faith in the Tsar's benevolence. And residual loyalty to Nicholas had since been swept away by the war and the rumors of pro-German sympathies and sexual shenanigans at court. The late Cambridge University historian E.H. Carr, who authored a voluminous history of the Soviet Union, said, the old order collapsed not because new claimants for power were pushing it aside, but through its own inherent rottenness. Still, the initial aftermath was intoxicating. Allow me to share some impressions from the Russian novelist Boris Pasternak, who lived from 1890 to 1960. In Dr. Zhivago, he writes, the revolution broke out involuntarily, like breath held for too long. And as the revolution burst forth, Pasternak tells us, individual Russians revived and were reborn. In the heady first days of the revolution, anything seemed possible. The protagonist, Zhivago, in a novel that would earn Pasternak a Nobel Prize and worldwide acclaim, is a physician who welcomes the fall of the old order. He sees individual Russians as becoming revived and reborn. A feeling of infinite possibility is conveyed by Zhivago to Lara, the woman he loves and who's not his wife, in this statement. Just think what a time it is now. Zhivago says, and you and I are living in these days. Only once in eternity do such unprecedented things happen. Think, the roof over the whole of Russia has been torn off, and we and all the people find ourselves under the open sky, and there's nobody to spy on us. Freedom, real, not just in words and demands, but fallen from the sky beyond all expectation. In the weeks after Nicholas II's abdication, political and civic energy gripped the capital. Petrograders darted from one political meeting to another. Some 40,000 middle and working class women participated in the largest suffrage demonstration in the country's history, demanding that the provisional government extend to them the right to vote. And indeed, just a few months later, the provisional government declared universal suffrage along with broader political and civil rights. Voting, at a date still to be determined, would elect a new constituent assembly. A crowd described by the British ambassador as bigger than anything he'd ever seen held a public memorial for those who died in February. Poems, prose, songs, and speeches united those present. An embryonic civic culture was being born 
all too quickly. Such jubilation was supplanted by a realization of the enormous challenges Russia faced. Two institutions were competing for legitimacy in the capital. Middle-class aspirations were represented by the provisional government, while workers and soldiers were more likely to align with the Petrograd Soviet of workers and soldiers' deputies. The Soviet refused efforts by the provisional government to merge the groups into a unified body. Meanwhile, other Soviets formed in cities across Russia, some 700 of them, consisting of 200,000 deputies. And by October 1917, the number of Soviets had doubled to 1,400. I should be clear that these were not Bolshevik-dominated bodies. Although there were Bolsheviks among them, that is, members of the self-described majority faction of the Russian Social Democratic Party, the Soviets were diverse and fluctuating arrays of socialist workers, intellectuals, and other activists. Indeed, the Bolsheviks didn't originally play a fundamental role. But then, the provisional government refused to enact the most urgent change that so many in Russia craved. In spite of hopes that Russia would end its involvement in the war, the government instead declared its commitment to see the campaign through to its conclusion. Russia's Western allies recognized the provisional government as the country's legitimate authority, but the Russian working class was less convinced. The situation that existed in the spring and summer of 1917 has been called a state of dual power. The provisional government, in the words of Rex Wade, had formal authority but limited power, while the Soviet had real power but no formal responsibility for government. The social and economic problems that had prompted the revolution in the first place remained. Citizens scrambled for provisions and the prospect of more barren months ahead terrified ordinary Russians. Again, we can turn to Pasternak for his insights. Pasternak wrote that people in the cities were helpless as children in the face of the approaching unknown. The family members of the fictional Dr. Zhivago were better off than most, but nevertheless, they acted as if they were living in the wilderness without the benefit of modern conveniences, now stockpiling food and firewood. By the fall of 1917, it fell to the revolutionary Bolsheviks and their leader, Vladimir Lenin, to settle the uncertainty. Lenin had been living in exile in Western Europe, but he'd returned to Russia after the February Revolution gained momentum, and he'd arrived on April 3rd, 1917. Upon disembarking from a train at Finland Station in Petrograd, the Bolshevik leader delivered his famous April Theses Address to supporters that had assembled to greet him. In it, Lenin called for an immediate peace, bread for the people, land for the peasants who worked it, and for all power to be transferred to the Soviets. Over the next several months, his message resonated with those most in need. Support grew, and by September, the Bolsheviks held majorities in both the Moscow and Petrograd Soviets. In turn, Lenin planned to seize control of the government on the people's behalf. A Congress of Soviets, that is, a gathering of representatives from the many hundreds of smaller Soviets across the country, was scheduled to convene in Petrograd in October. That's when Lenin planned to strike, and the provisional government unintentionally abetted his plans. The former legislative body had reorganized and appointed as prime minister Alexander Kerensky, who was a socialist but not a Bolshevik. Kerensky was also both a government minister and a Soviet member, but he'd increasingly demonstrated that his primary allegiance was to the provisional government and the forces of stability and order. In early October, Kerensky's government announced that half the Petrograd garrison of Russian soldiers would be moved out of the capital to defend against the advancing German army. The Petrograd Soviet, however, viewed this as a provocative move and created its own military revolutionary committee to resist the transfer of Russian troops. So when Kerensky's government gave the order to the garrison to march out, the military revolutionary committee ordered it to stay put. A confrontation was unavoidable. In the early morning hours of October 24, 1917, 
Kerensky ordered the Bolsheviks' printing press closed. In the first organized move against the party that had defied the will of the provisional government. In retaliation, Leon Trotsky, the head of the Soviet's Military Revolutionary Committee, instructed his men and armed supporters to seize strategic points in the city. By October 25th, this group, known as the Red Guards, was in control of many important sections of the city. That morning, the Red Guards broke up a meeting of the pre-parliament, or the Council of the Republic, which was filled with leading political figures from a wide assortment of parties. The Red Guards herded them out at gunpoint, and then they besieged the Tsar's former residence, the Winter Palace, where the provisional government was housed. That evening, after a delay of several hours occasioned by the skirmishes between Red Guards and the defenders of the provisional government, the second all-Russian Congress of Soviets opened. With cannon fire in the distance, some socialist leaders condemned what they described as a Bolshevik conspiracy and urged members to forge a united democratic government. A delegation of moderates now departed to offer their support to the provisional government. As they left, the Bolshevik Leon Trotsky rose to condemn them. You are miserable, isolated individuals, he said. You are bankrupt. You have played out your role. Go where you belong, into the dustbin of history. Hours later, news arrived that the Red Guards had seized the Winter Palace. And then, just before 5 a.m. on October 26, 1917, the Bolshevik intellectual Anatoly Lunacharsky stood to read a proclamation from Lenin's pen before an exhausted but now jubilant rump congress of Bolshevik supporters. Lunacharsky relayed Lenin's pronouncement. The provisional government had been overthrown and the mantle of Russian power had been transferred to the Soviets. A second revolution had occurred. A new era had begun. <laughs>